Welcome everybody. Our special guest for today's interview is Barbara A. Porter, who was the Director of American Center of Oriental Research in Jordan from 2006 to March 2020. ACOR was established in 1968 and its permanent headquarters are in Amman, which opened in uh, 1986 across from the University of Jordan. Um, Barbara received her AB from Bryn Mawr College and her MA, MPhil, and PhD from Columbia University's Department of Art, History, and Archaeology. Her dissertation dealt with old Syrian popular site Cylinder Seals from 1978 to 86. She was on the curatorial staff of the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art, Egyptian Art, and Ancient Near Eastern Art in New York and in the 90s taught at NYU. In 10 years before moving to the Jordan, she led archeological tours from Algeria to Iran, including several trips to Turkey. Early in her tenure as ACOR director, she was an organizer of the 10th International Conference on the H History and Archaeological uh, Archaeology of Jordan that took place in Washington, DC in May, 2007. 11 years later, she presided over ACOR's 50th anniversary. Barbara, welcome to Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikey. I'm glad to be here. So, Let's talk a little bit about your background before we get into ACOR. Um, not everybody grows up dreaming to become an archaeologist. When, when did you first um, think to yourself, I want to study archaeology, and I want to study archaeology um, in the Arab world? Well, fortunately, I grew up, and I'm one of six kids, we grew up in Lebanon from 1965 to 70. And because of those five years, at that time, I already knew at age 15, I wanted to be an archeologist. And fortunately, there was a mentor who I'll mention later, a man named Jim Pritchard, who said, well, if you want to do archeology, span you should, I recommend Bryn Mawr College. And that's why I chose Bryn Mawr. And that's why I did my whole four year undergraduate there with one year at the University of Vienna. But it's definitely growing up in Lebanon that led to my being a Near Eastern archeologist. But were there, like, did you have other classmates who were like interested in archaeology too? Not everyone who grows up in Lebanon decides to We had to an archaeology club, and my twin sister Joan was part of it. She actually became a banker, but now is involved in the archaeology of Iraq. So obviously, there's still a draw. I would say in my class, there were not others who did archaeology, but in, at ACS, American Community School at Beirut, uh, Scott Redford, who was a, a class or two behind, he's now a very prominent. Islamic archaeologist who teaches in London. So it, it happens. Um, yeah. Most people don't persist because it's actually pretty arduous training in terms of, you know, both the graduate school and getting the grants and keeping up. Uh, I was just lucky I could persist. Amazing. Okay. So let's go back to um, your studies. You went to Bryn Mawr. Mm -hmm. When did you first hear the word ACOR? Do you remember? Actually, I do because in 1977, I was invited to excavate in the Jordan Valley. And at that point, we actually stayed at ACOR. So I already probably knew about it in the early, it started in 68. I already knew about it in the early 70s, again, because of this mentor, uh, Jim Pritchard, who was one of the found founders of ACOR. But I only saw it for the first time in 1977, when it was a much smaller place than the place I ended up presiding over. So at that point, there was a long-term director named Jim Sauer, who in terms of the archaeology of Jordan is a major figure and basically made that relationship between an American research center and Jordanian colleagues very strong by teaching and guiding people and encouraging people to work in the country. So let's go back to 1968 and let's uh, get some some background. So for those who can't see the screen, I have up on the screen a quote from a 25 year anniversary report that's quoting the original board of trustees letter. And I'll read what it says. It says, um, the president of uh, the American schools of oriental research, ASOR, um, on December 7th, 1967, included the following statement. American cultural relations with the Arab world are in a critical stage. We have to move as promptly as possible, extending our resources to the very limit to activate American historical and cultural activities, particularly in those lands where our organization has a primary responsibility, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and other countries at the so southern tip of Arabia. So how, how much does this sentiment, how much did this sentiment actually um, 
persist throughout the, the first sort of like early stages of ACOR and ASOR and what is the difference between those two different organizations? So Azor as an institution really started in 1900 in Jerusalem and was the sort of the binding element. It had different names, but let's say um, it was Azor at the time of 67. This statement comes out of the 67 war, which basically influenced archeology span in the whole region. People who had worked in Jordan, um, some could continue, but they couldn't do it from Jerusalem and vice versa. So what's fascinating about this particular statement by G.E. Wright, who was the president of the board, is that it has actually more relevance now than it does in 67, because Azor has a um, essentially a, a remit that includes all those countries. Now, they have institutional centers in Amman, being ACOR, one in um, Cyprus called Kari, and then, of course, Jerusalem, now called the Albright School. So there are those three schools, but they actually have committees in Damascus and Baghdad because at the moment it's too hard to actually have, you know, he headquarters in those places. But they've worked, you know, in Yemen. They worked all over. What was fascinating, Mikey, is he also, besides the Amman Center that then became in 1968, he really wanted one in Beirut. But that never happened. And that's again, you know, politics of archaeology, because the French really were the strong members who really ran the archaeology of foreign teams. Again, obviously we're not talking about you know not the, the teams in country in Syria and Lebanon. So America didn't make inroads there at the time, although there were some American projects I'll talk about later. Interesting. Okay, so how does that tie into the the, the late sixties and seventies um, in terms of ACOR's work? So in very early on in sixty eight, and this is a nice example of the, what was for two years the headquarters in a small building. You know, those who know I'm on near the first circle, and in any case, what they were trying to do is to start activating being a research center that would support people coming to work in the country. They had some of their own projects. Again, I referred to Jim Sauer. He was actually involved in ceramics and read the ceramics of many projects. But really, it was almost a conduit for assisting people coming from outside. And it wasn't always just Americans. Also, Canadians were very important almost from the beginning. But even to help other projects, because at that point, it was the only international center that was there. The British, the German, and the French all happened later in Lebanon and in, in, in Jordan. So ACOR played a really important role in those sort of formative years of trying to continue to have archaeological presence in the country. And by 1970, um, 1968, they moved into a small headquarters again. And then they kept moving because basically the rents went up like they do almost the whole world over and they had fights with the landlords. So fortunately in the early eighties, they decided, and you know, we'll be talking about it maybe a bit later, but they decided they needed to buy land and build their own purpose built building. So that's why the University of Jordan presence in 1986 that opened and I was lucky to be there in 1987. So I saw it from the beginning. Yeah. What was the reception of local archaeologists or or local sort of um, would-be archaeologists at the time? And how has that sort of changed over the decades? Do you have a sense of that? I actually very much do because, uh, for one, a man named Zidane Kafafi, who's a major archaeologist in Jordan, and I stay really good friends with, who worked in the Jordan Valley in 77. I just wrote an article about the 100 years of the, um, all the overseas centers, particularly the American, the British, the French, and the German. And he wrote back and was trying to define how ACOR, what the role it played in his life. Jim Sauer was on his committee. Many of the so-called, you know, they were part-time directors at ACOR taught at the University of Jordan. They taught people at the, the Department of Antiquities. There's one thing I should start off with saying, any archeological project in Jordan has to be affiliated with the Department of Antiquities of Jordan. And so those relationships were there from the beginning. And essentially the Department of Antiquities of Jordan encouraged Azor to have a center in Amman and also to be part of this whole new teaching philosophy, because at that point, they didn't have a major program of archaeology. It was just being built up. You know, something was um, was alluded to in that original passage about sort of the politics of archaeology. Mm -hmm. Is that felt on a daily basis, like throughout your career? Do you feel 
that you are navigating a political space during that time? You are. And then I'm also going to address the slide because it's, it's important. Um, for one, many people, in, I went to graduate school in the 70s. At that point, there were a whole crew of people who were working in Iran. And all of a sudden, at the end of the 70s, they couldn't work in Iran anymore. So they ended up like moving to Syria or other places and changing their whole, you know, sort of the trajectory of where they were going to work and what they were going to address in terms of questions for archaeology. So the reason I want to also point out this slide, you're seeing the late Ghazi Bishi, who was director general of antiquities in the 80s and 90s. He got his degree from the University of Michigan and really cared about making sure the foreign projects were supported by the department and vice versa that they also supported the department. And here you're looking at the beginning of a project in the middle of this town of Madaba. You know, obviously I, there's some wonderful people from Jordan like Nasser who's on this, so I don't have to explain where Madaba is, but it's southwest of Amman and it was one of ACOR's choices in the 90s to essentially make this town, there was, you know, fantastic churches to unveil and then to protect. And so that was really a major project done mostly under the aegis of my predecessors, Pierre and Patricia Bakai. But again, in this picture, Ghazi on the one side, you have a gentleman from USAID and USAID was the basically the United States Agency for International Development, for those who don't know, who essentially provided the funds because, okay, there's the politics of archeology, span but there's also the money in archeology. span This is not a cheap, uh, and never. So you have to always be constantly conscious of, let's say, for example, in, in a country, maybe getting the embassy to support you, wh whatever nationality you are, British, French, German, Dutch, um, et cetera, Japanese, uh, or you then end up getting some major funding, it could be EU funding these days, but ACOR could never have done its work in country without the major funding of USAID, which started already in 68, they were giving money to help on the Amman Citadel, and it's continued actually to this day that they're still giving money to ACOR for specific projects. Of course, you have to apply for those grants. So here you can see in the mid 90s, again, on the Amman Citadel, there's a, a wonderful Roman temple complex, often called the Temple of Hercules, and the restoration of part of that, following something called the Venice Charter, um, was done in the 90s, partly really for tourism. I mean, so USAID cares more about economy than about history. And so having this new central place in the middle of Amman be a place that people could visit. And then later on in the 2000s, they did another master plan that shows different um, paths and good signage, which in, basically for all archaeologists who leave a site and want people to visit it, you care about the signs that are there so people can understand how you're interpreting that site. And luckily on the Amman Citadel, there's now excellent signage thanks to USAID. Okay, so this brings me to a question that I really wanna ask, which is what makes a good archeological site or archeological project? And let me preface this by talking about uh, the Petra Church. And, and articles that you've been uh, quoted in, you've talked about how this is a really good example of a successful project in ACOR's history. So, so explain record, that. Uh, this is not the Petra Church, it'll be the next slide. This is the monastery, but now we've got the aerial view of the Petra Church. Uh, but the monastery is also, anybody in the audience who've been to Petra have climbed up the thousand steps to, to, to the so-called monastery, but it's actually a Nabataean structure. Here, the Petra Church, was a project that was devised with USAID under the rubric of Pierre and Patricia Bakai, with actually the help of Tom Daly of USAID. And essentially started with a man named Ken Russell, who said on that hillside in that middle center city of Petra, there is a church. And so they actually planned a long-term program that included getting the funding, knowing they could do it for at least two years plus plus, getting a whole conservation team. And so for me, a archaeological project that knows that it's going to find a church and likely mosaics, having devised a conservation program and bringing people, because at that point there weren't that many conservators who could do this amazing work on these incredible mosaics, and they are incredible. I mean, at this point, they dated to the sixth century. If you look at mosaics at Jerash or in Madaba, all fantastic, but many of them have been changed in the seventh century where the faces were taken away because whatever it was a 
Christian or Muslim prescription against live things. Whereas here, this was probably buried by 600 and the faces really pop out. So for me, when I look at this, I can tell the story about how it, it shows you different elements. The, the female figure in the middle is actually the image of fall. You know, we can go on and on about the animals, but the fact that they were conservators and they did this long-term projection, you know, sort of starting in 1991, sadly, Ken Russell died. They got a whole other group of team, um, people from Jordan, like Harriet Amar, but, um, um, you know, Amanding Big Fiema was the director of the project. The Bakais were also, of course, the you know, ultimate directors from ACOR and in Amman. And what happened in 1993, in December, they discovered 140 papyrus scrolls. And that story itself, you can go to the ACOR website and hear us all talk about them when we finally publish volume five. And the papyrus scrolls, I don't know if I can show, were actually found in this room in December, 1993. Because once they had covered all those mosaics, they realized they needed to create a shelter. And so then they went down and that's when they found the papyrus scrolls here, a complete surprise. Because organic material like that doesn't usually preserve. So the fact that they were willing to undo all this over really three years of arduous work. Normally an excavation will be maximum three months. This was actually, they almost worked nonstop for a year, which is way too long. You get burned out because it's very intense. They also had to deal with snow and other elements. So I'm using this as a good project where it's planned ahead. Most excavations they say will be within three months and maybe even less. And they're usually asking, asking some some major questions for the work to be to respond to. Here, what they were trying to do is to uncover this church on the hillside, but they didn't know that in 10 years more, they would have uncovered two more. So you end up having this really massive change on this hillside of three fantastic churches that now anybody who goes to Petra can go see. What does upset me is a lot of people go to Petra and don't see them. I'm like, why wouldn't you climb and wonder what's under that really beautiful shelter designed by Rob Schutler and opened to the public in 1998? So if you haven't gone to Petra and you're going to go, make sure you go under the shelter. So, okay, here, here's my question. Mm -hmm. Take me back to 1990, a year before this starts. Sure. What do they see? Like, they see what do they see and what don't they see? Okay, at that point on the hillside, they see a little circle or archway of the Eastern apse of stones, maybe two courses. They see a few tessera in stone and glass that would have been used for, because the walls also had mosaics, but we only have really preserved the floor mosaics. So that is where Ken Russell, who had worked earlier to the West in what later will be an ACOR project, the Temple of the Lions, but he was working with a man named Philip Hammond. And so he knew that hillside very well. So when he was asked by ACOR and USAID, you know, is there, and I don't know why they really wanted to ask if there was a church there, but he could say, yeah, there's a church up there. Because what they were trying to do is to get a whole new area of Petra that people would go visit. Uh, the Temple of the Winged Lions is a very important Nabataean temple. It was excavated until basically under the responsibility of Philip Hammond. And then after he died, Basically, in 2009, Acor took it on in order to preserve it. But it's a lot harder to understand that temple than it is a amazing basilica church with gorgeous mosaics on the floor, which again is what you're seeing. And I will say also, Pierre Bakai was really pretty ingenious about funding, so he took very rich people to this site in like 2001, and he he said, "Well, why don't you virtually adopt a mosaic?" Your $2,000 can help preserve and create this endowment for this church that ACOR can then continue to preserve it. So there are probably about 50 people from that tour group on who have actually supported the creation of the endowment for the Petra Church. So again, funding is an issue, yeah. having the vision, but they had no idea what they were going to find. And they certainly didn't think they were going to find 150 papyrus scrolls that would rewrite the sixth century history of Petra. Sounds like uh, it sounds like these mosaics need to be NFTs, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess they kind of already are. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you mentioned, uh, you know, before the call, I was talking to you about some slides and uh, what I what I wanted to chat about, and I showed you this image, and you're like, oh my god, I don't recognize this because 
I don't immediately recognize this because this is not the way I see it now. And for those who can't see the screen, there's an image of the Temple of the Winged Lions in Petra. And what you're used to seeing is the sort of the post production, <laughs> the after image. And so if you would, tell me how much work goes from before to after, how many years, how many people, um, how much do you, how much are you surprised by the result? So what you're looking at here is actually a really perfect example to describe how this project evolved. When Philip Hammond from Utah excavated there for many, many seasons, he, this is the central cella where the Holy of Holies, where people would have moved around kind of like the Kaaba. And so here it's where you have the residual of the sandstone um, plinth and podium and around it, these columns, which would have had in the capitals image of winged lions. That's why it gets its name because we don't entirely know who it was dedicated to, but it was likely get dedicated to the main great goddess. So I know this is a capsule from about four years ago where a man named Franco Ciorelli was the one doing conservation with the whole big team of people from the local community who were being trained to do the plaster work to do the mortar work they needed to preserve this. So unfortunately, it, the elements, it, had, it was wide open to the sky for many, many years. And so trying to arrest some of the damage that comes from rain, but actually the worst damage is from the water from underground coming up in capillary action, having the salts basically splinter the surface of much of this. So you have, this is the core of the temple. It's a very large complex. To the east of it is a place which we call a lapidarium, where they've put more of the fragments that have not been reinstalled. And this is not a temple that should be reconstructed. Across the way from it is something called the sometimes called the Great Temple, which was excavated by Brown University. And they actually spent from 1991 to like 2006, many seasons every summer, restoring it. Whereas this is should be preserved like a time capsule of where it is now and figuring out how to maintain is the Petra Park, the Petra um, Development Authority, they actually need to be involved in helping preserve this. This was not, this basically in the stages of Hammond's work, uh, he you know, published the reports. Now, of course, trying to combine his records and since the 2009, 2010 efforts called the Temple of the Wounded Lions Cultural Resource Management Initiative, putting all of that together in a final publication, which would probably take another three years. The other thing to yeah. finally say, if you're going to excavate, you have to publish both in preliminary reports and in the final report. OK. We first met each other uh, many years ago in Lebanon. Um, and the sort of national, one of the many national images in Lebanon is Baalbuk, right? You see it on the, you see it on in airports and on postcards. Um, and it's a very sort of like Lebanese symbol, as much as Petra is very much a Jordanian symbol, right? Um, do you kind of cringe when these archaeological sites and like ancient sites are kind of co-opted for um, modern national identities? No, I don't, but I just remind people, this is the dare, the monastery, yeah. not the Petra church, it's okay. Um, no, I don't, because I feel that they are ways of encouraging people to come to the country. Now that mm -hmm. COVID is not over, but eased up, you know, having the economy of Jordan relies on tourism, as did Lebanon, so did Syria. I mean, all these places now, Saudi Arabia is trying to make it a pillar of their changes. So, I mean, I know that for the footprint of all of our lives to do all this travel is another issue which we won't discuss now, but having the chance to go to see these places and not just see them, but interact with the people who live there, to me is really something important. So for example, up in the North at Umkais, this was a village that has an Ottoman period village and then has fantastic Byzantine levels and Roman period levels and actually has much earlier than that, but let's, let's just live with that, that I would want everybody who sees this conversation to say, oh, I've never been to Umkais. I really should go there. And so I actually should have looked again to see which images are on the money that was designed by Amar Hamash, because 
These are all again like stamps, but the money has images of Jerash and of course the Citadel. Um, actually, I should take pictures of those to remind myself. And I don't, it doesn't bother me um, yeah. because I actually think it's important for people to know what's, what exists in these countries and what is a point of pride. Yeah. So if money were no, if funding were no option mm -hmm. and were no obstacle, um, what is your sort of your, your wish list? Let's say you had unlimited uh, funding and you had 10 years to work on any projects um, right now. What is sort of the wish list that you're like, oh my God, this, I, these are the 10 projects, these are five projects, these are the three projects that I really, really, really wish there was funding for? Well, I'm gonna start with, I really think now we've actually uncovered a lot. And so even though we say in Petra it's only like 2%, I would just concentrate if funds in preservation or if there's some places where there's a few un major unanswered questions, like what really was below this level, because often you stop and you don't go below because you've gotten to a level that answers the questions that the excavators has or whatever. But preservation and conservation and actually training the people in country to be the ones to be the caretakers of their past. Because at the moment, you know, we have foreign projects to go in. If we're lucky, we can work with Jordanians or I'm talking about Jordan, but also Lebanon. And that, that will continue. But sometimes I would say, I'll use Jordan as an example. There are many very important, you know, archaeologists and historians, but in terms of conservation, there's only a handful of people who can really do the conservation. So you found the objects, they end up in a museum or in their, either on display or in the storerooms, and you don't really have enough people to be the caretakers of the past. So if I was going to put money into the whole system of archaeology and museums, it would be in conservation efforts. Yeah. Are there, um, is that across the, the Arab world more broadly, or are there places you think that um, need it more desperately than others, like geographic places? Um, I actually think Jordan needs it pretty desperately. Uh, Lebanon has some very wonderful conservators. Iraq needs it too, because now they're having all of these museums, and so they need to have many more people who are there to handle the objects um, on a conservation level, not just a curatorial level. But also even the curatorial level, the understanding of what you're under, what you're uncovering. It, you know, as you know, it took me 25 years to do my dissertation on cylinder seals. These things don't happen overnight. And the opportunity for people, because right now in Jordan, you can't actually get a PhD in archaeology. So fortunately, some people have been able to go to Germany or England, relatively few recent times to the States. And I wish, again, more funding would be for those opportunities. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, sort of, I, I wanted to mention this earlier. I think one of the first times we met, you had mentioned that we like to describe the term, we like to talk about ACOR as ACOR as opposed to the American Center for Oriental uh, Research. Um, when, did that, when did that decision get made? And why would you say that's an important decision? Well, for one, now ACOR, in 2020, they made they took out the Oriental, and so it's the American Center of Research. And that has, obviously, that can be an hour discussion, but it had to do with the fact that Oriental was really disturbing many, many people, and it was time to change. For me, ACOR, as a, as a stronger statement, um, and then partly just not emphasize the American part, because in my mind, I would like to inter sort of stress the international part because it doesn't just serve uh, North Americans. I mean, in terms of people who used to come and use ACOR as a base, uh, of course you have the Finnish team who are working on the papyri, but you had Dutch archeologists, you had German archeologists, Japanese. And so making it more an entity that was a center for everybody, I think by taking up, emphasizing the American, it made it more international. So we're going to have core soon. <laughs> <laughs> Might do. You never know. Except the funding comes from the U.S. government. So yeah. I do believe that we should still honor that for sure. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your work at the Met. Because um, I'm curious about the relationship between museums and archaeologists on the ground. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And sure. how that relationship may and how it may should uh, uh, change going forward? 
So for one, I should acknowledge that my first boss at the Met, Christine Lilliquist, is on this talk. And I worked with her for five years when we were redoing the Egyptian galleries. And I'm, it's called, so it was called phase three. I'm still honored that that was finished in 1983, that in those galleries, the only signage that stood on the walls was done by me. So of that time, there's many, much, much wonderful signage. So those five years define me. I mean, those who know me, I'm very much an object oriented person. So the opportunity to work with excavated material from Egypt and then on three years later to the, in the ancient Near Eastern galleries, which are the objects that you're showing was truly a privilege. But the museum world has changed dramatically. I think it's a, just like teaching. I think both of these are professions that have the potential to be minefields because for example, right now you end up having um, within museums provenance studies and where do things come from and should they go back to be repatriated to the countries? Again, that's an hour lecture and other people could do that. I mean, I just finished the New York Times reading the museum section that was this past weekend and it referenced the work by a woman named Victoria Reed at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts who's doing a lot of research on provenance studies and what things should be sent back, things like the Benin bronzes, et cetera. So trying, to, the, the Egyptian department at the Met was very fortunate is that much of their collection came from the partage that was legitimate at the time of objects that they excavated and they were divided by the Department of Antiquities at the time, the state board or whatever name you wanna use. So working with that, so in my mind, still legitimate collection was a privilege but things have changed completely. So for example, cylinder seals are a slippery slope because there are probably 100,000 of them in, in the world. The Met has a nice collection of which they've gotten from various ways, a few from excavations, but mostly mostly from gifts. So the question is, these were taken out of the countries of origin already in like 1790, I can document things that left Syria that are now are in Paris. And the question would be, you know, when obviously things that have come out since the early 70s are completely illegal. And I would remind everybody that don't pick up sherds on the site, you know, these state, leave these things on the ground. Now these countries are fortunately much more uh, cognizant that things should stay in country. And so that's part of the tradition that's there. What I do hope for museums is that there'll be much more of an exchange of borrowing from museums. And that happened in Jordan when I was there. There were several Metropolitan Museum shows that I was able to help facilitate bringing objects to the Met as part of major exhibits, like when Byzantium met Islam. And by virtue of helping the Department of Antiquities work with the Metropolitan Museum, getting these things to a major show where people again can see, oh, wow, Jordan's got this. I really would like to go visit Jordan, is what I think much more of these exchanges, which are actually, of course, happening all over the world anyway. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, um, I feel like I've seen this shift at least through the the work we do through our fikra. I've seen this sort of uh, subtle shift happening. Uh, you alluded to another subtle shift, which is a uh, global reluctance to travel. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about archaeology, like tourism. Mm -hmm. um, in the Arab world, and you mentioned Saudi. Saudi is making enormous amounts of investment to um, have sort of the global population associate Saudi with all these uh, heritage sites. Um, have you noticed since you became the director of ACOR a, a difference in excitement about going to these places from local populations or from tourists? Or have you seen a decline? Well, I think pre-COVID, I think there was actually a rise in, in interest in tourism. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm looking from the Western perspective, but luckily now in Jordan, there's actually more people doing local tourism in their neighborhood because they couldn't travel. So they went to see the sites, but I'm gonna do the Western perspective of the types of tours that I led. And I would say that there's actually an increase especially when COVID you know, settles itself. Um, and it's partly economic. There are people who are retired who would like to see the world. They worked so hard. It was their opportunity now to go discover, you know, I don't really like the word bucket list, but people have things, countries on you know, their bucket list. And so I think that there'll be an increase and actually for the sake of these countries that need it for tourism, 
I actually hope so, except for I know the economic imprint. So you have to do a balance sheet about how you're saving the planet by taking this trip all the way to Jordan from California or to Saudi Arabia. You know, it, it's, it's complicated and there's no right or wrong. Well, there might be right or wrong, but right now I'm not going to address it. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a, a, a basic, basic, basic question? Sure. And this is for people who are listening. Um, who are the Nebataeans? Ah, well, they were, their capital is Petra in the southern part of Jordan. They were really a client kingdom of Arabs that at the same time that Roman, Rome was coming to the east and controlling parts of it, they had territory that went from Damascus all the way down to northern Saudi Arabia to what is now called Al-Ula, ancient Hegra, many used call the term Medan Saleh. So they were very extensive in terms of their spread based on their wealth and their activities with, with trade. And so Petra as their center city, maybe there was about 20,000 people who lived there. They had their tombs cut into the fantastic cliffs. And we luckily have a line of kings and queens that we can talk about. Unfortunately in Petra, they documented very little by writing. And that's a whole lecture on itself. I can happily uh, send to you a lecture I gave just on this subject, and I would be happy to share it with anybody who wants it. So I would say that, and I actually recently here in the, in the city met a friend of my younger brothers who basically never heard of the Nabataeans. And it's like, I mean, I forgot that people never heard of the Nabataeans because of course it's been the fabric of my life for you know 50 years. Yeah. Uh, so I now do try to qualify you know, who they are when I say, oh, and you must go to Petra because it's the capital of the Nabataeans and has amazing things to see. So, so um, let me add a little more meat to the, the bones. What did they, if they didn't write, do we know what they spoke? Well, it's actually, the language is Nabataean and they did write and down in, uh, what's so amazing about Hegra in Al-Ula is that there on their tombs, they would have fantastic descriptions in Nabataean, basically saying, this is the tomb of so-and-so. I'm a lawyer. I built this for my daughter and my granddaughters. And if you touch it, you know, you'll, you'll be down to hell. There are many th things along those lines. Unfortunately, in Petra, they're like little inscriptions praising a god or my name, but they're not on their tomb walls, except for like five instances within the whole 800 tombs of, of Petra. So it was very limited writing, and we don't know why. I have different theories, but that's another talk as well. And just going over the geography, because you said it quite quickly, it's basically on the Khat al-Hijaz, or is it other um, ways? Well, basically, east, there's a Jordan well. called the King's Highway, so you come down. It also was sort of incense routes, because when they came from South Saudi Arabia or Yemen with their incense, they would get to Petra, and then they would transship it over to Gaza. Gaza was incredibly important at the time. It was really a major city and spectacularly wealthy. Um, and so... It, and it continued to be in Byzantine times and the beautiful churches there as well. So the transship, and then would be transshipped to Egypt and the rest of the Mediterranean world. So it was a hub in terms of trade, but it also was a center in terms of religion and things like that. And what years are we talking about? Basically, I always say the heyday is from the second century BCE to like 106 CE is when the Romans, quote unquote, took over. But of course, the Nabataeans stayed there. They just, you know, there was a Roman government, just changed the government and yeah. you could worship and stuff like that. But even in Byzantine times, we know from these papyri found in the Betra church that they're often honoring sort of Nab Nabataean forefathers' names. So they stayed around, they didn't leave. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to some of the quick Q&A and then we're going to have questions from the audience and then yeah. we'll take from there. Okay, so the first question is what are you reading or watching right now well for one since i'm part of about 10 different learned societies i was always have to read those journals i then of course read the new york times and washington post in the evening back to back but in order to relax at night i choose certain types of books and i have beside my bedside actually i have it on a table elsewhere 20 books but right now i'm actually reading abdul rahman munif's book uh, Cities of Salt, yeah. because it's, it was published first in Lebanon in 1984. I'm reading, obviously, not the Arabic version, I'm sad to say, but the 1987 translation by Peter Theroux. And the reason I chose this one is that now that I'm taking tours to Saudi Arabia, it mixes understanding a past in Saudi before 
you know, basically petrodollars and oil changed that landscape. And so I really wanted to get into how that would have felt in a community there. So I'm now just sort of really, you know, a tenth into this book, but I plan to read the two ones that follow, one called The Trench. Yeah, so you're, you're on volume one. I'm on volume one. And it, cool. it's actually slow reading, to be honest, um, because it's yeah. so beautifully written that instead of, you don't want to skim it like you would a mystery novel. And I have to laugh. I thought I would be reading mystery novels in my quote unquote retirement. I haven't read one in a year. So I guess I've just changed my taste. Um, yeah. But I want to get back to it because they're fun. Interesting story about Cities of Salt. It's actually, uh, it's not a trilogy. It's a, it's a five-parter. Okay. Um, and I just read but two part, no, the, four part, five part. Okay, thank you. No, the, the reason the reason why there's confusion about it is because the Arabic version is a trilogy, but uh, the only three parts have been commissioned for translation, um, okay. and so there's this missing fourth and five, uh, fifth one in Arabic. Okay, next. Tell question. me about four and five another time. Yeah. I'd love to know. <laughs> okay, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? So I actually thought of a woman, some know a lot about her, Gertrude Bell, who basically in 1899 went to Jerusalem to study Arabic. She had already time in Iran. She ended up being a very political figure that played a role in terms of the development in Iraq. But in the end of her life, um, just sadly she died quite relatively young, archaeology was what she, she loved. And she used to travel around on these amazing trips. And right beside me I have six major books about her. Um, the first one was really written in 1996 by Janet Wallach, but her travels were by horseback. So unfortunately, if I want to shadow her, I have to learn how to ride a horse. And also I would invite my twin sister, Joan, because she is the uh, vice chairman of the British Institute for the Study of Iraq, which is the Gertrude Bell Memorial. So she actually knows a lot more about Gertrude Bell than I. So she could ask Gertrude Bell the right questions. I would just sort of be looking at the incredible landscape that she went from Jerusalem, went down to Petra, then went up to, you know, basically the Haran and got to Damascus, ended in Lebanon, where she chose to, this is like 1900, take some seeds from the cedar of Lebanon to, to plant in her family's estate in England. And there's a cedar of Lebanon there. So there's, so I would want to do the archaeological part, which she did a lot. She studied places and carefully and documented them and was actually an excellent photographer. So I'd like to just observe her methodology, but not talk politics. Cool. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Well, I would think that um, in terms of archaeology, people, because of you know, Indiana Jones, they always see the glamour of it. And I'm an archaeologist, but then, of course, I became more of an administrator when I ran ACOR, but I was always supporting archaeology. And people don't realize how painstaking the process is. And in terms of, you might get an exciting find from time to time, that, and actually right now in Jordan, there was an amazing find in the Eastern Desert uh, just um, last October, but that was after you know, many, many years of working in this area. And so you have to realize that you just have to plot away, be it in the process of, you know, planning the excavation, excavating, and then of course, publishing. Very interesting. Okay, last question. Um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? I'm sure there's a long list, but if you were to choose one. Well, I decided I would actually choose a mentor whom I mentioned at the beginning, Jim Pritchard, who worked first in Jericho with Kathleen Kenyon and his own excavations in Palestine, then came over to Jordan to work in the Jordan Valley at a site called Tel Asadia. That's why I got there in 1977. But I knew him from Lebanon because he excavated after the 67 war, of course he could no longer work in the Jordan Valley. So he came to Lebanon and started an excavation at a site called Seraphon between uh, Sidon and Tyre. Material at the AUB Museum comes from, from Seraphon. And so, I really do admire that he persisted in trying to reconstruct, you know, again, the politics of archaeology, tried to make sure that he could keep going. He taught the University of Pennsylvania, and it, I'm an archaeologist because of him. There's no question about it. So he did inspire me, and as I say, he was the one who told me to go to Bryn Mawr. And so I would say I would love to have more time with him. He sadly died some years ago, but he and his wife Anne were wonderful friends of mine. When I went to Bryn Mawr, they were at Haverford. So they were like a second family as well. It, I feel like uh, archaeology is, um, is a very physical endeavor. Yeah. Um, 
Can you be a fantastic archaeologist in your 90s? My philosophy is it's better to stop in your 60s. Physically, just your knees may no longer like it. Um, and I think some people actually try too long. There are a couple of fantastic archaeologists in their 70s. I think if by your 90s you're still alive and you haven't published everything you were supposed to publish, then you're no longer a good archaeologist or great archaeologist. You've been remiss. And there's a lot of literature on that right now because there's so many people who have a backlog because if they, don't, if they continue to work in the field, you have no time to publish. You need to sit back like a one or two years and process what you've done and then go back in the field. And there's some people who've done that very well, but not everybody. Okay. All right, we got three questions so far. The first one comes from Camelia. You have been page after that. If you'd like me to ask your question, please let me know. Camelia, Actually, why don't you ask me? It's nice, thanks. Yeah, so Camelia says, what strategies are used to limit imposing present day biases and assumptions about societies, objects, buildings, et cetera, on interpretation of findings? Great question. Well, I think that people who are excavators, who, ex who actually at universities, already have sort of a system in place that allows them to be much more reflective about the process and what they're finding, because there certainly are benchmarks that are considered really important in universities today. So things have changed in that regard. Uh, so, I mean, I myself, I excavated, you know, the last excavation that I actually physically did was at Tel Elan up in northeastern Syria in Kurdish territory in 1987. So I've been an observer of everybody else's projects, but I haven't had a chance, and I believe me, I, I really don't want to go down in the trenches anymore. Um, I, I know my knees couldn't handle it. Um, I couldn't even be a good gardener because of that. So I don't think it really answers your question so much, but there's a lot of literature about that. And it's again, respect to what you're finding. I mean, you have to be really mindful of the privilege it is to uncover things and making sure that they're taken care of is really one of my main philosophies in life. Okay. Um, from Ehab, what country have you not seen in the Near East or the region um, and feel like it's important for you to visit and cross off your quote unquote bucket list? Well, I should point out that Ehab is the man who, for, to whom I actually work because I lead these tours, like Saudi Arabia last November, Jordan just now. Um, believe it or not, I, except for Bahrain and the Gulf, I've not done a very good job about the Gulf. And I do think to understand the Middle East, one has to have the opportunity to visit certain sites there. I've luckily been to Oman. I would have, of course, loved to have gone to Yemen at one point in my life. My twin sister got there, but I never did. Um, and for example, like the museums in Doha and you know in Qatar in general, as a museum person, I also think it's important for me to be able to go there and make my opinions about these places in person, not just in the books. Cool. Paige asks, is there anything specific that you hope that the Jordanian government might do in the near future to continue a path towards preservation and conservation of its archeological sites? It relates to what I had hoped before is that there are many more chances for people in the department to actually have really strong training for the, the fields. And that actually likely means going out of the country for a few years and coming back to make sure that you know, whatever they learn in a museum setting somewhere else or a conservation program, I mean, the great, there's several great ones, comes back in country. For example, I'll actually refer to Fatma Mari, who had the opportunity to go to University College London and has come back and is one of the rare fully trained, you know, PhD conservators who actually did her PhD on the glass from the Petra Church. So having more people get professional development within the Department of Antiquities itself. And unfortunately, I'll say sometimes people were given opportunities and were not allowed to leave. So that's not a way to run a department. You've really got to encourage professional development as much as you can. And luckily, ACOR does a lot with helping with that. There, there are grants at ACOR that people can get, and let's hope that continues. OK, I think we can squeeze in two more questions. One comes from Chris Langdon. The Swedish-UK archaeologist described the Jordanian site of Jawa as the best preserved fourth millennium town yet discovered anywhere in the world, paradoxically in a place, the Black Desert, where it could hardly exist today and probably hardly when it was built, um, end quote. He stopped digging and left Jawa in 1976. Has there been any further work on the town and its 
uh, ideological invasions in the past 46 Actually, years? Indeed, uh, Bernd Müller Neuhoff of the German Department of the um, DII, the German Archaeological Institute, has been working for the last 10 years there. Unfortunately, some of the grant money ran out, but otherwise he, he would continue. And the work he's done is astronomical in terms of understanding that in the fourth millennium, how they um, basically manage the water. And so there's a lot of details. So Bert Müller Neuhaus is his name. Just put Jawa into Google and you'll find it uh, because the hinterlands, when I did my, 50, my 50th anniversary reflections of being in Jordan. The cover image is actually at Jawa. It was taken by my friend Jane Taylor, who's in the audience. And I only was able to be there once, but it was with Bert, who was able to show us both the middle bronze and the early bronze material there, which is, is absolutely incredible. I mean, these massive stones to create this walled city in what seems to be in the middle of nowhere, but obviously a lot of people came there. So it's a great place to try to learn more about. Cool. Um, I think this may be our last question. Muhammad asks, what happened to the Albright Museum's collection in Jerusalem? Is there any relationship between ACOR and the Albright Museum? Well, the Albright doesn't have a museum. There's the Rockefeller, which is part of the Palestine uh, Museum. And it was basically a first British run. And then of course some Azor helped them as well. The Albright, just like almost all archeological uh, uh, institutes probably has a small collection, things that were residual from excavations that were not part of Partage, didn't go to a museum. Um, and I, I actually only saw a few objects. I honestly don't think the Albright has a museum per se. Whereas, for example, um, you know, the other institutes, the German institutes have small collections. ACOR has a small collection that I know the new director, Pierce Paul Christman, is hoping to get more of it on view in sort of rotating exhibits. Um, again, if you have it, you should share it. And so that's what I could answer for that one. Okay, my last question, actually, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna steal the last question. Um, <laughs> talking, because you mentioned Qatar and you mentioned, uh, you know, Saudi and a bunch of the places in, in the GCC that are doing more and more archeological work. Um, what role is, uh, is the US or, you know, Europe uh, playing in assisting in that uh, archaeology, or is it almost entirely being done um, with uh, folks from the region? It's again like almost our archaeology in the Middle East, a mixture where you'll have foreign teams. There's some great British teams, some Australian working in these countries. And I'm just mentioning a few. The French are working everywhere, but I should be quite honest, um, and doing a fantastic job in Saudi Arabia. So, but these days, almost all of them will be joint projects. Um, Jordan still has projects that aren't joint so much with, you know, obviously they're always under the aegis of the Department of Antiquities. But I would say that in, in the Gulf and in Saudi, they're more binational uh, groupings, which is really important because then you're sharing the transfer of knowledge, making sure that those in country, and of course in Saudi, there are many wonderful archeological programs in their universities. So they have their own programs, but yet sometimes some of those people are able to participate in the foreign teams as well. Amazing. Well, Barbara, thank you so, so, so much for making time to talk to us and give us some context about the history of ACOR and, and your history as well. Thank you very much. And there are many people in the audience who are old friends from different phases of my life. So I say hi and look forward to connecting with you as well. And for those who uh, celebrate Eid, I wish you Eid Mubarak. I didn't say that in the beginning, so I say it at the end. Masalama and great to be together. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye, everybody. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We have another event. This will go up on our podcast tomorrow. Uh, I left a link into the chat about how to give feedback on today's event. And this will go up on YouTube as well tomorrow. Okay, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Looking forward to more. Bye-bye.